Welcome to China Manufacturing Decoded from Sophieast, the podcast where we take you through some of the major topics facing importers and manufacturers in China today. Hello again, listener. Welcome along to episode twenty of China Manufacturing Decoded. Today, Renault and I are discussing everything that you need to know about management system standards and auditing them. No doubt you've heard of ISO nine thousand and one, for example. Well, this is one of the management system standards that we're going to be discussing today. Why are they important to importers? Their relevance to manufacturers? What are some key examples? Is there a smart way to implement these standards? Maybe there's a way that is not as good. And how does auditing them work? This and a lot more is what we're going to get into now. Today's topic that we're recording on the podcast. Is about management system standards, and what I want to know is why you think that importers and buyers should be paying a lot of attention to these. Well, if 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 you've been, you know, contacting Chinese suppliers suppliers anywhere, they 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 will, you know, some of them will tell you, hey, we are ISO nine thousand one certified. Hey, we are. ISO fourteen thousand one certified and so on, and uh, so it, it does help to have a little bit of understanding of of, of what it means, um, and also as you sort of you 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 try to put together some criteria maybe for qualifying suppliers that you know have the right profile for your company. You, you you might want to include some of that in two ways. First is maybe some of them are already certified and we, we'll go into that. I mean, <laughs> there's apples and oranges there, uh, but uh, that, that might be something that maybe gives them extra points in, in the qualification process. Uh, and, and then if, uh, let's say you, you you want to do some auditing on, on, on your, you know, yourself, uh, maybe with your own team or with, with an outside company, but you want to, you want to decide on the criteria. You, you want them to have a checklist maybe. Well, uh, should that checklist just come out from <laughs> your, your imagination or, you know, will it help that some of these checkpoints actually come from some of these international standards? Actually, yes, it will help. Because if the suppliers have, have already been working on satisfying the criteria of, say, ISO 9001, uh, and they do it well, well, you know, you're saving everybody time if you say, okay, hey, um, do, you know, do you, uh, you know, how do you communicate your requirements to your own suppliers? Do you know, is it very clear? Is it all documented and written? Ta 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 ta. You know, and they say, oh yes, of course. Look. You know, we've already been re- working on that and we've been asked the same question by 10 auditors before. Okay, that's, that, that becomes a thoughtless for everybody. Uh, you're not adding complexity to their, uh, to their business. You keep auditing uh, relatively simple and straightforward and you keep actually more time for your auditors to, to, to work on maybe some other aspects uh, where they would need more time, let's say, right? So uh, all, all of these points that are important, actually, they are, they are quite important and they, uh, they are already covered by international standards. You might want to, um, to keep close to it. Hmm. Is there a way that you can tie in management system standards to working with suppliers in China specifically? So if you do have Chinese suppliers, is there Is there something that you need to be considering with these guys with regards to the standards that they may be telling you that they are adhering to? Sure. So if they say they they are adhering to a standard, that actually doesn't mean much. If they say they are compliant to a standard, yeah, you know, they they conform to a standard or something. Okay, that just means that they say they are aware of it and they say that they are doing something about it. They're following it. Mm. It doesn't mean they're certified. Then if they say they're certified, um, it might be true, it might not be true. That can usually be verified, uh, maybe by the, going on the website of, 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 um, of the certifying body. 
Mm. Um, and of course, they might be certified by, you know, the top of the line sort of certifying body, or they might be certified by, um, you know, a, a, a local company um, that might be part of all the schemes and be, you know, themselves audited by and and then approved by accreditation bodies, uh, or might just be doing that because anybody, you know, tomorrow actually I could start saying, hey, I can certify you to ISO 9001, right? There's no problem mm -hmm. with that. Uh, I, you know, I write a paper that says, yeah, this is a certificate, you know, and I found you in, in compliance with, with, with all the requirements as ISO 9001 for such and such scope, you know, your, your design and manufacture wooden toys, da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I can do that, but is anybody going to pay attention to that? No, because I'm not working with any, you know, accreditation board that actually gives me the, 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 the um, some, some credibility, right? So first mm. thing is this certifying bodies that are, they've been called um, certify, certification mills or accreditation mills. Certification accreditation means the same. Uh, and, and then there are those that are accredited, yes. So they have the rights to show these extra logos on the certificate and, and, and yes, they are on the list of, uh, you know, uh, accredited certified body um, mm. for, you know, for, for that kind of standard in that country and so on. Uh, but the thing is the standards often are, are, are good. Um, they are helpful. Like, you know, ISO 9001 and similar management system standards are good standards. They, um, I mean, it's good that everybody sort of has the same terminology. You know, this is a correction, this is a corrective action, uh, whatever, you know. Um, what do you mean? You don't even know what calibration means. I mean, come on. You know, all of the, the key terms in ISO 9001 are, it's good to standardize them, right? Mm. Um, and, 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 and really at the end of the day, if you do good management, you're gonna do a lot of that anyway. Uh, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna try to set some, uh, try to think of what you want to accomplish. You're gonna try to turn it into some measurable objectives and you, you're gonna define who has to do what and you're gonna follow up on that and you're gonna see if you succeed or not and you're gonna take some actions uh, consistent with, again, with your objectives and what you want to, 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 to accomplish. And then from time to time, you're going to have some internal auditing, you know, some people checking and confirming that, you know, uh, the work is getting done the way it's supposed to be done or not. And, mm -hmm. and um, documenting some of the, the procedures and how to do the work. And from time to time, you know, having a management review, of, you know, going over things. Now, you might not document all that. You might not do it in a very formal way. Uh, these international um, standards for management systems sometimes will force you to document some of that and keep traces, right? But, but really, um, it's, it's, it, it just provide a framework and, and in itself, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a good thing. I mean, it's helpful. If, if, um, if I see a, a factory is certified to ISO 9001 from a top of the line certifying body, yes, it does give me some confidence. And, you know, it might not make much sense to go and audit them. Right. I mean, or it might make sense as I'm going to <laughs> we're going to discuss later. Right. Mm. Um, but but it does provide some confidence. It does provide some confidence. So the um, so there are some fake certificates, and there are certificates that are issued by companies that really don't provide much confidence at all. Right. So that of course you need to understand what you're getting into. Mm, yeah. So as part of your vetting process, and we've already discussed this in earlier podcasts about vetting Chinese suppliers, um, you really need to be considering if they are giving you certifications, you know, those also need to be checked as part of the vetting process. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. so many fake documents. I mean, it's so tempting. Yes. Right. Okay. And 
you've mentioned ISO 9001 a couple of times. I guess most listeners are going to be fairly au fait with, with what that is. But are there some, maybe you can give a list of some key examples of measurement system standards and maybe like a brief summary of, of what each one is. So we have a better overview sure. of the kinds of standards that we're talking about today. Right. So ISO 9001 is, is, is sort of a, think about it as a, a I don't know how to say. <laughs> um, for some people, it's like a grandfather of management system standards. I know it's, it was mm. not the first one to be uh, to be developed and so on, but uh, you know it, it's been the basis for the development of a lot of others uh, that have taken inspiration from you know the way it sets a framework, right? So, thousand and thousand one is, let's say, you know, is a quality management system standard. Uh, it it, it, it's really all around quality and, and making sure that the organization is, is focused on its customers' needs and, and is, you know, is, is trying to improve in that regard. Okay. Um, there's, there's some other quality management system standards that are specific to some industries, you know, like ISO 13485 for medical devices. So it does add certain requirements it's not that different from 9001 but it does some add some extra requirements that are you know that makes sense for, for, for medical devices right uh, <clears throat> there's um iatf um, 16949 for the components that go into vehicles you know automotive parts so that one is really iso 9001 plus or plus plus it adds a lot of things so it's not it's 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 um, um, how to say it is the things that that really car makers really want their uh, their suppliers to comply with, um, and so it it really adds several layers of of extra requirements, um, and, and it really um, <laughs> goes much more in depth. Uh, so all of these are quality measurement standards, and there are others right for aerospace and so on. Um, there are also others that don't focus on quality, but uh, help an organization uh, fulfill its obligations and, and drive improvement in other areas, such as being more environmentally friendly. That's 14,001, 1401. Such as, you know, there's one about health and safety. I think it's 45,001. Uh, there's uh, information security, 27,001. And, and so on and so forth. Actually, it's, it's, it's getting to be a pretty long list, right? Uh, and all of them are sets of requirements. Uh, and, and all of them can be the basis for a certification, right? So th th these are some examples. And the most common ones that we see in, uh, in, in factories in China are 9001 and 14001. And usually mm. because some customers <laughs> at one point sort of pushed the supplier. No, you really have to, to, to do that if you want to keep, you know, working with us or if you want our business. And then, you know, factory does all the work, implements it in a good way or in a bad way. <laughs> um, and, 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 and then usually they, they keep it alive as long as they see uh, some, some benefits. Usually Chinese companies don't do that just to get better or to, you know, have more assurance, uh, you know, about their ability to, to meet their targets. It, it's in 90, I don't know, 98% of cases, it is to be more appealing to customers, really. That's, that's the reality of it in China. That's just the way mm. people are, are thinking here. With China's new, um, well, not new, but sort of recent uh, focus on, for example, protecting the environment. Does any of this come down from the government as well? Is the government actually requesting or pushing uh, manufacturers, yeah. for instance, to put this sort of thing in place? Mm, uh, good question. And the government, the Chinese government has been uh, pushing new regulations. So that's their way of, of pushing companies. Now, the, the problem is there's, there's often a gap between the regulation and the reality on the ground mm. so they've, they've been enforcing it 
much, much more uh, tightly since what, 2017, I guess. Uh, mm. There was a period from 2017 to 2019 where it was, you know, that you had this team reporting directly to Beijing who, um, who was moving from province to province and, and looking at different companies in different industrial parks. And they would, they would come in and, and, you know, really forcefully uh, sometimes uh, c come in, like break down doors and things like that. I mean, there's been a lot of crazy videos. And, uh, you know, they, they, they had the power to just stop everything. Uh, so you, you had more and more companies doing the dirty stuff at night. And then so, the, you know, the, the inspectors are trying to catch up with that also, but it's much harder. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, you've been living in Shenzhen. Maybe you were smelling some smells at night that you were not smelling during the day, right? So that's sort of the, that's an, an example. Um, so, yeah, well, look, luckily where I was in the city center, um, I don't think we had too much of that, but I know what right. you're talking about. Right, right. If you were in the center, like in, um, in the middle of Bawan, yeah, you, you, you mm. might feel that. Um, so that's the government's approach. Uh, and, and recently they kind of, you know, with the crisis and, and everything, they, um, they put back on, on, on this a lot. Uh, but it, it's been quite effective, actually. Uh, they really stopped a lot of polluting activities. Um, that, 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 that's great. Now, obviously, if... A manufacturer was a bit afraid of that if they had processes that were either consuming an enormous amount of energy or releasing waste to the the the, the soil the water the air you know and especially if they knew that um, they were maybe flirting or maybe really way above the um, the maximum uh, allowance, uh, you know, the, the, from, based on the government's uh, regulations, would it make sense for them to to to, to get ISO fourteen thousand one certified and to, to you know to pro project some confidence? Yes, yes. Mm. So did it have some impact? Very probably. I mean, the awareness of the importance of environmental issues really went up in the past four years in China, and 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 worldwide. I mean. You know, over the past uh, 10, 15 years, you know, um, people have really been monitoring how much carbon is released in the atmosphere and how much it drives uh, um, climate change and, you know, some other things like the loss of biodiversity and the amount of plastic in the oceans and all these things. And really, you know, more and more companies are following the, the, you know the leaders like Patagonia and others because really mm. it's good business. I mean Patagonia is doing great, yeah. Um, because it does really appeal to you know five, ten, maybe twenty percent of consumers, and they're really they're willing to, to 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 pay to have a good product made by made by Patagonia in good conditions and so on. So um, there there's been a, a heightened awareness that did translate into uh, changes in, in you know consumer practices consumer choices so yes it, it, uh, it this was sort of a you know a big wave pushing uh, the uh, ISO 14001 standard and its implementations and certifications definitely mm, okay good now you, you did mention as well that some of the uh, some of the Chinese manufacturers for example, had been requested or required to implement more than one standard. So you gave the example of ISO 9001 and 14001. So I was going to ask, can a company be certified to two standards at the same time? Clearly they can because you've said so. So, I mean, is this, is this something that is, you know, of great benefit to a lot of suppliers, for example, like what, what are the circumstances where this is seen and it's useful? Well, first, if you have implemented one of these standards well, you have sort of the whole framework already in place. Then it's a matter of adding some extra, extra objectives and extra criteria and, and, and uh, having some extra actions. And really the, the standard doesn't tell you to be very, very aggressive you know, with, with uh, the degree of improvement that you, you want to drive. Uh, mm -hmm. So 
you you already have the framework. Let's say you already have 9001, you want to put in place uh, 14001. Um, a lot of the things are, you know, 80 to 90% similar. And then you're gonna have to, to think of your whole supply chain, you know, and the whole life cycle of the product. And you're gonna have to think of what, you know, in what ways does your company significantly impact the environment? And then based on these ways, you're gonna set, you know, a few objectives and track them and drive some, drive some actions based on them. Uh, but again, it can be very minor sort of actions. You, you know, if your objectives are not very aggressive, so you can set things in place. It's not necessarily an enormous amount of work. It's not necessarily uh, very, um, you know, giving you a lot of extra constraints. Uh, so. The, uh, of course, there's a lot of companies that have that are certified to more than one standard. Now, what we've seen is some companies that do it in a really, really bad way. So, this is the, the typical, typical company that that thinks, okay, I want the certificate. I, okay, I want, I need to implement this. Well, I, I, okay, I don't know how to do that, so I'm going to pay a consultant, but I don't want to pay too much. I don't want mm. to have my, my, my core team, you know, the quality manager, production manager, and so on. I don't really want, to, want them to spend a lot of time working on that because they, they're already pretty busy. So because consultant is going to come, give us some papers, ta, 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 make everything look good. And then they're going to brief one person, typically the, um, the, t- typically the quality manager, let's say for 1,000, 1,001, to... Um, to answer the auditor's questions and to show them the right papers and everything. Now, is this all integrated into the company's day-to-day business? No. So a good auditor will pick up on that and say, well, you know, uh, we really look at the way the work really gets done and, uh, and, 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 and it's not gonna be good, but the problem is many auditors don't really care about this. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of manufacturers get certified without really doing a good implementation. It's just paperwork. So that's the reality of it. And that's much more likely if the certifying body is, is a company that you've never heard of, let's say, right? In general. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they have one standard and then maybe it says that the annual, annual review is whatever on April 1st, and then they have their annual uh, audit from their certifying body, you know, maybe 15 days after that. And then they say, oh, environmental, yeah, we really need to do it. And then, okay, the, the team is already busy preparing all the all the documents <laughs> in uh, in March. So let's get that first of June, then they're gonna work on that in May to prepare all the, the right stuff to the auditor on, on in, in, in June. And so basically they're stacking stuff on top of each other just stacking some extra work for themselves. That's really the um, not very smart way to do that. And, and in, in general, is quite ineffective, actually. Uh, it's really paperwork for the sake of paperwork and, and, and for the sake of getting the certification, right? Now, the smart way to, to do that is to, yeah, of course, yeah, involve a consultant if you don't have the, the right expertise in house or if key resources are very busy, but the team is gonna have to do some of the work to actually um, make sure that, you know, what's documented is really the way we do things and that the objectives are really going to be integrated into the objectives of the business and, and uh, the, you know, it's gonna be followed up like, like the rest of the, um, uh, the the improvement actions of the business and, and so on and so forth. So um, it, it it does take time, uh, but then when it's in place, it doesn't add much extra work. That's the key. It's you know putting new systems in place, uh, but if you do it the right way, it doesn't add much paperwork to do, um, and that's really what you want, right? And then once you have one of these frameworks in place, then you add a second framework. Let's say after 9001, you implement 14001. Well, you're gonna add some extra things into your existing menu, into your existing policy, into your existing objectives, into your existing da 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 da, da right? Uh, your existing internal audit, maybe your existing management review. You're gonna add certain things into there so to make 
to make sure it also covers environmental aspects. And then you're gonna have the same auditors audit both. So um, uh, that's the, the really sad state. Again, the standards are, are, are good standards, you know, overall they're pretty good, but the, uh, the certifying bodies um, and, and, and the auditors and, and all of these people very often push in the wrong direction. So a lot of auditing firms, or certifying bodies, you know, CBs, they, they will say, well, yeah, but no, it's really a different animal. You know, it's, it's, you know, if you want this certification, it's here. And then another certification, we have to do everything again, you know, from scratch and so on. And then, of course, it's good business for them because they do two times the audit, right? Mm. <laughs> um, that's great. Um, does it make sense for the organization that is audited and wants to be certified? Absolutely not. Mm. So, um, and I don't want to name names here, but this this is actually quite common. Quite common. In 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 our company, Sophist, we are um, certified to ISO 9001 by BSI, the British Standard Institution. And these guys are sort of the top of the line. They, they, they originated the grandfather of the most of these management system standards actually. And they really uh, want to be seen as the top of the line. And then they're, um, what they're trying to do is really to cross train their auditors a lot so that the same auditors can do, you know, 45,001, uh, 14,001, 9,001, whatever, you know, and then if you want to integrate these different management systems into one system, they will send the same auditors and <laughs> maybe only adds one Monday of work for them to certify you to this extra standard because as they do all of their work, let's say you are 9,001, 14,001, 14, they will, they will look at the same time as the quality aspect, uh, the quality aspect and the environmental aspect, pop, 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 pop. and there's a lot of a lot of clauses in the standard that sort of overlap. Not exactly. Uh, it's more like you know, uh, 70, 70 to ninety percent. A lot of them overlap, but they cannot audit them actually at the same time. Um, and it, it 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 is cheaper for the for the ODT. It is less time consuming, and it really pushes them in the right direction, which is really to integrate all of this into the way, you know, this is the way to do the business. And, you know, we, we, we have a very formal, maybe I should not say formal, yeah, in a sense formal, but in a, a very structured approach to managing both the quality aspects and the environmental aspects of our business, right? Um, that's that's really the, the smart way, I would say the right way to do it. Uh, but mm. again, um, <laughs> as I always say, the standards are good, the um, certification process really went very, very wrong <laughs> uh, and is not getting any better. So that's that's the reality of it. Mm. Uh, that, that's good advice, certainly not sort of uh, doing uh, too much work uh, when actually it can be streamlined in, in such, a, such an effective way. I suppose some companies aren't going to turn down the money. They're not going to alert some of the customers to, well, you know, actually we could, we could stack these together and do it at the same time when they can make double the profit. So yeah, I think it's something to be aware of. Yeah, of course. And, and a lot of ODTs, you know, the organizations that want to be certified don't really know about that. Many of them are mm. not familiar with that. And sure. hey, if I ask these guys and they tell me this and I ask these other guys and they also tell me this, well, it's sort of, okay, that's the way it is. I have to accept it. It's, um, it's a tax, you know, it's a um, cost of doing business or whatever, you know, that's okay. Well, we guess we have to do it anyway. Right. And that's, mm. that's really sad. Okay. And the certification process, you've mentioned different, uh, different issuing bodies. So does the process vary depending on the body? And if that's the case, can this cause any problems? Uh, not, not really. This is really all very uh, standardized and 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 um, structured in the in the same way, pretty much. I would say no, no. They they would, you know, they they would do their um, 
uh, what is his first stage and then second stage and they certify you for three years and they come back you know once or twice a year typically mm -hmm. uh, for surveillance audits and then everything's fine they keep going and then they um, you know every three years you have the the more formal audit which goes a little bit more in depth now this is very very typical okay and if we want to learn more about standards what's the logical path to do that <laughs> well that 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 is another one of these um, these 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 rocketeering sort of schemes. So, right. if you ask the and and by the way, the same companies do the training and the certifications very very mm -hmm. often, right? Uh, the most of the the training on the auditing of these uh, measurement system standards are usually done by the same companies that issue the certifications, um, which in itself is fine. I mean, as long as, I mean, there is a potential conflict of interest, of course, but they, they do it in sister companies. So it's not the same people who will do the certifications and then say, well, you know, to really get better, you should do some training with us. And then, yeah, you will get a, you know, a better appraisal, you know, the, so that they remove the, the these, these kinds of incentives. But okay, let, let, let's say everything's fine and we don't worry about that. So. What, what, what they say is there's sort of a step-by-step -step approach where, oh, you know, well, first, before you start to, to, to learn how to audit, you need to learn about the standard. And maybe also purchase the standard. You can purchase it from us, actually, or through another company, right? Uh, then, um, once you have a, an overall view of the standard and what requirements it includes, um, Maybe you need a training on the implementation. You know, that's mm -hmm. the first one maybe was one day. The second one is a couple of days uh, or three days, two to three days, it depends. Uh, so we, we, you know, we, we'll go through the standard again and then we'll, we'll review some uh, common practices and so on. And then you can start to learn how to do the, the auditing. But, you know, if you don't have much experience in auditing, you can really jump all the way to the lead auditor training. You have to do first internal auditor training, which typically is also two to three days. And as well, once you've done all this, yeah, you can really apply, you know, and, and go for the lead auditor training, which is top of the line, which has a more complicated kind of exam at the end. And you really need to be familiar with, with all of this, you know, before and, and, and so on. And <laughs> I, I'll tell you, this is, it doesn't really make sense. Now, of course, if you take someone who has zero understanding about quality management uh, in an ISO 9001 lead auditor training course, they might fail. I've, I've, uh, I've seen that. Uh, however, if you have some prior understanding either of quality management or about another management system standard, you're gonna do fine. You're gonna do fine, right? Uh, so they, they try to 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 push you to basically spend more in training. And then of course, these standards are reviewed every what five or six years, and there might be a new version. Like um, 2015, there was a new new version of 9001, a new version of 14001. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, of course, they tell you, well, there's been some changes. You need a one-day transition course. <laughs> well, okay, but, you know, there's some articles in professional uh, professional um, reviews and that, that explain all of these changes. You don't need to go and, and pay for a one-day training. Now, the thing is, if you do that and you go for the one-day training, you get the certificate of attendance. And then... This all goes back to uh, paperwork for the sake of paperwork. So a lot of consultants will, and, and actually a lot of auditors also believe that if, um, oh, you're implementing 14001, oh, you started to do some internal auditing. Okay. Do you have some people who really like, who are trained to, to, to do that? You know, and oh, um, and then if you say, yes, look, this internal auditor is, certified as a lead auditor to, uh, to the latest version of this standard. Oh, okay, great. If it's not the latest version, they might say, oh, um, you know, but is he aware of the latest standard? You know, because it's not exactly the same as the one before. Oh yeah, look, look, transition course. 
attendance certificate. You know, it's 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 sort of a joke, sort of a joke. Mm. Um, but it's it's um, a lot of organizations when they want to implement this are looking for consultants who have all the right paperwork, which I kind of understand. You know, I mean, if they were very familiar with all the the requirements and what's really important, uh, they they will not need a consultant to start with. So. These are, by definition, people who you know don't really know what, what they're doing in that respect, and it's it's much more reassuring to them to have someone with all the credentials and all the papers and everything. So that's um, <laughs> that's my little riff about that. Okay, the, the issuing body's going to love you for that. Well, so <laughs> well deserved. Uh, with with auditing the management systems, then. Why and how are audits actually done? Uh, there's three kinds of, of um, audits. If you, you know, um, first party, second party, third party audits. You, you've probably already heard that, right? We say, oh, yeah. the third party audit. Da, da, da. Okay, so basically look at where you are in the supply chain. And let's say it's a factory, right? This is a factory that, fin- that makes finished products going to send them to um, to to the USA and they, they have a customer and the factory is let's say in Shanghai and, and the, the manufacturers in Los Angeles and the okay when the factory does their own internal auditing it's first party I audit myself right mm-hmm. so I, I I have sort of some requirements I might put in place a checklist and I have some people audit the work of other, other people within the company, right? Uh, this can be very, very good because these are people usually, typically who, who, um, who know how the work is done, you know, who, who know the operations intimately. So they can really pick up on issues that other external auditors might not pick up. Mm. The, the problem with that is what's the credibility when you show the report to maybe a customer? Uh, yeah, I mean, we audited ourselves and here's what we found, you know, everything's good. Yeah, right. All my suppliers say that, right? <clears throat> um, second party auditing is when the customer themselves either send one of their employees or work with an external agency to do that. And typically that's what we do a lot of, right? Mm. Uh, for for our clients, they maybe they, they, they're not sure they, they might want to work with that manufacturer but they, they can't really go and check them up and they so they, they they have us and an auditor there so what processes do they have in house and like you know check check on uh, you know the size is it really what they say and then do some auditing typically of the quality system right um and 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 then put all this in a report so this is very checklist based typically um there's, there's, there's a checklist, sometimes a long checklist, and the auditor has to go through all this. And then um, usually it leads to a score. So if you're hesitating between three different suppliers, you, you know, then with the score, you can compare them, right? Mm. And you, since it's based on the same checklist, hopefully they have all you know, the audits were done in the same way. If we change to another auditor, the score would be roughly the same. So if one of them gets a score of 90 and another one gets a score of 50, the one that get a 90 is much better. Basically, that's the, the idea here. And mm. some of our clients also uh, send us to do auditing of their current manufacturers, uh, simply to keep pressure on them to say, hey, you know, we're watching especially in times of change, like these days <laughs> with, mm. with the, the pandemic, really, um, you know, what, what happened? You know, uh, were there any significant changes to the business? Maybe, maybe they lost a big customer. Maybe they, they downsized. Maybe they are 20% of the size of last year. You know, who knows? If you're not on site, you don't, you don't know. And how has this impacted actually the way they, they manage their quality? Maybe it's terrible and maybe it is, the, the risks are 10 times higher this year than last year. That's what we've seen in some of the, the, the companies, right? So uh, that's, that's second party auditing. With second party auditing, you can also um, tell them 
you know, these are the major issues. And usually, you know, other companies in this, you know, in, in, in this industry would do this or that, or really spend time actually to go down to the root cause with them, make sure it's really very, very obvious to them what the problem is in a way that makes it very, very obvious what the, what a good solution would be. I mean, in some cases it's pretty obvious, you know, you, I pick a um, micrometer and I look at the, uh, I look for a sticker and there's no sticker at all. So, hey, was this calibrated? Uh, 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 maybe, uh, we're not mm-hmm. sure. Uh, you know, the, oh, the guy who did that, he left the company, so we're not sure, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, no, guys, provide assurance that this has been calibrated, please, right? I mean, the, the solution is pretty obvious. However, sometimes they, um, they have a recurring problem somewhere in the process. And then uh, you don't want to tell them, no, you really need to add someone extra just to check on that and stop the problems. You're just adding cost to them, right? This is an administrative measure. It's, it's, it might be good in the very short term, but in the long run, they get to do something in the process to, uh, to actually address the root cause, right? Mm. So you, you, you don't necessarily want to give them um, a prescribed solution you have to do that obviously but you really want them to understand to make to do the work actually of of understanding where it comes from because very often that leads to a good solution um but not all second party auditors would do that actually it's 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 not so common um why because they sort of look look up to the first uh, third party sorry third party auditors and very often it they tend to mimic them a little bit, which doesn't make much sense to me. So let's get to the third party audits. Third party auditors come in and usually it's tied to a certification, right? Uh, like for us, BSI comes in once a year and, and, and checks us up and everything. And then, uh, you, I mean, this year, last year, they say, okay, zero, zero nonconformity, you know, all good. Thank you very much. See you next year. That's the good, um, the good outcome. Uh, but in some cases, for some companies, it's not that good. Um, so they have very, very clear criteria. You know, if, if it's for, let's say, 9001, they, they have all these clauses from uh, section four to section 10 of the standard. And then they, um, they, they have to go all along, to follow all these clauses and check them up, right? Now, the, Maybe every three years, when they do it very carefully, they they try to cover nearly all of the clauses, but uh, or maybe all of them. I'm not even sure. But when they come just for the surveillance audits, they you know oh this year they will cover this 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 this. Next year they will look at what was checked before and they will try to cover some others. But they still have to cover so many clauses. It's crazy. So and 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 they they often have very limited time and they can't really go in depth into it. And what does that mean? It means it's very hard for them to actually find some non-conformities. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very, very hard. And they're not familiar with the organization. Very often there's a rotation of these auditors. They, they come and it's the, you know, it's the last time you see them. Next, next time is the next one, which is good when it comes to objectivity and impartiality which is really the, the, the foremost considerations, but it's, it's not that good when it comes to really um, going deep into the, 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 the operations and seeing if they really walk the, the, the talk, you know? So um, that, that's why uh, we see so many companies that get certified and then we work with them and we're like, how in the world did they get their certification? You know, hmm. well, that, that, you know, maybe I should call the certifying certification body. I mean, there's, there's something here that's a little bit fishy. There's no way, right? Um, and that, that's the reason. Um, so again, there's, there's always pros and cons, right? First party audit, it's kind of difficult to make sure it was done in a very independent and objective manner it doesn't have that much credibility. However, it can be done so much more in depth by people who really know the operations. Um, Second party um, tries to go in depth, but they often don't really know the operations also. 
right? It really depends. It really depends, I have to say. And then third party, it's all about keeping track of everything that is checked and making sure that it's done in a very objective way, but it's done by people who hopefully know the operations, but not, don't necessarily know them very well and don't know this organization. And so it, there's a, actually a lower chance of finding issues. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it does. It, that's, that, that's interesting because I think a lot of people would perhaps automatically assume that getting audited by the big boys is automatically going to be one of the better options. But actually, depending on what you're looking for, it may not necessarily be the first, uh, the first route to go oh, yeah. on. Oh yeah, no, no, no. So if, if, if it's a, a company uh, that does manufacturing, so a third party auditor will spend a lot of time on, uh, you know, just covering the entire standard and really not going much in depth, but mm. a, um, you know, someone who's familiar with manufacturing in general would know the, especially based on the activity of that company, maybe the, the five things you want to check uh, and and usually, if it's if it's not a world class company, you will find some issues, right? Uh, and we actually we covered this a little bit in the past. Uh, we did in, um, supplier vetting. Yeah, we, we went through uh, I forget seven or eight um, mm -hmm. important checkpoints. So, but the, the, it's really not the business of the third party auditor. Really, that's not what the the purpose, you know, of, of sending them there. Mm. And I suppose that also impacts on the solution side of it, which you mentioned with second party audits. And certainly I know is something that Southeast tries to do, although an auditor isn't necessarily there to provide solutions. If they have a good enough understanding of what's going on, they can provide some guidance, let's say, or some advice moving forward, which perhaps a third party auditor just isn't going to be able to do. So a third party auditor... Again, with all the emphasis on impartiality, independence, and everything, will not mm. do it. I mean, they're not allowed to do it very clearly, mm -hmm. right? I mean, sometimes they, were, they want to be nice. They would drop uh, maybe a couple of examples from other companies. Yeah, that happens. But that, that's all you can hope for. <laughs> mm. um, and they, it will never be written in any report or anything. And they will never say they told you to do that, right? It's, it's just um, you should really press them. So uh, second party audits. Um, a lot of our clients just want us to go and evaluate factories that are not yet their suppliers. So in that case, it doesn't make that much sense to tell them, oh yeah, you know, how about you do this or you do that? They just want us to go there, evaluate and, and, and leave and, and give a very accurate picture, as accurate as possible of what happens. Some right. clients tell us, yeah, you know, audit them and then uh, I want it to be a program. And as, as part of that program, you're gonna, you know, we audit the current suppliers once a year and you're going to do this and that and I want it to drive improvement, you know, keep pressure on them and also drive improvement. Well, in that case, yes, um, there are ways to do that. Uh, again, as I explained before, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to, uh, to do maybe one day the audit and then another day someone else uh, comes with more of an engineering background and, and actually goes through the, the top two, three, four issues, it depends. Maybe top one issue is there's really some issues um, mm. on, on the process side of and, and, and work with them, right? Uh, this is, um, you know, it's just auditing and consulting, right? Mm. Um, and it, it's, it's fine. I mean, the, at the end of the day, what's the purpose for our clients? Uh, the purpose for our clients is to get a better supplier base. So there's no, there's no conflict here. But this would never, ever, ever happen for a third party auditor. Everything is done to prevent that, actually. Right, I get it. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a lot of information to take in today. That's a really good one. I think uh, we can pretty yes. much safely say we've covered everything that people need to know about management systems and, uh, and the <laughs> auditing that takes place. So, yeah, thanks for that. That's really good. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Adrian. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, don't forget to like and share. And you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other places that you get your podcasts from. See you next time.